I am uh, delighted to be here this morning. I have uh, uh, been so very impressed with the kind of conversations and programming that is happening around the world, which for you is much of Europe. But since I do not live and work in Europe, there is a other part of the world from where I come. I normally live in India. Most of my work is there, practical work. <clears throat> and uh, I have been asked to share what is happening in the rest of the world outside Europe. I must say that um, in the last 10 years or so, I have been learning a great deal about what is happening in Europe, particularly uh, through the Living Knowledge Network and the movement of science shops around Europe. Uh, I have also been uh, fortunate to be associated with the uh, Enrich project uh, under Horizon 2020, which I'm part of the advisory group, and met uh, some of you in Dublin last June. Uh, there is something about RRI-related events. They seem to happen when either Brexit happens or Mr. Trump wins election. So when we were in Dublin, Brexit had happened and a lot of you were disturbed, and it seems like some of you are disturbed because of Mr. Trump's victory. But uh, that's the nature of the world. Um, you haven't even heard about what else is happening in other countries other than UK and US. Um, <clears throat> as Melanie said, it is a mouthful. My uh, co-chair, Dr. Bud Hall, who works in um, University of Victoria in Western Canada, and I live and work in Priya, Participatory Research in Asia is a non-profit research and training institution which is completing 35 years. Bud and I began to talk about participatory research in late 70s. So our journey is nearly four decades. Um, we have been um, associated with uh, GUNI, Global University Network, for innovations, which uh, continues to have his head office and secretariat in Barcelona. And through GUNI, we also came in contact with a number of other uh, actors around the world who were doing uh, engaged scholarship. And uh, Bud and I were guest editors of the fifth higher education report of GUNI, which was released in 2014. Some of you may have seen it. If you haven't seen it, do see it. Um, that report is titled Knowledge, Engagement and Higher Education, Contribution to Social Change. And uh, the sixth higher, higher education report of GUNI is taking that agenda forward and translating it into balancing between local and global relevance of higher education. And why it is important is because uh, our world has become increasingly interconnected and so relevance cannot be defined only in 100 kilometer radius. Relevance also has to be situated in the larger context. Um, I want to share with you results of two studies that as UNESCO chair we conducted over the last three years. Some of you may have read or heard about it. While the GUNI reports are published by Paul Grave and cost a hell of a lot of money, uh, all publications of UNESCO chair are open source and are available on our website, can be downloaded. The first uh, study we did in 2014-15, this book called Strengthening Community University Research Partnerships, Global Perspectives. Open source, this is only a hard copy. I'm going to present it to folks from La Casia Foundation, I carried it all the way so that they can hold it in their hands. In this study, which uh, we had responses from 53, 53 countries, the phrase which was most commonly used in community university research partnerships is a phrase called co-construction of knowledge. And yesterday, some of you talked about it. So 95% of respondents make this as a key priority. But later down the line, when we ask them, and who frames the research question, only 15% of research questions came in conversation with community. So research agenda continues to be fixed by academic and research 
institutions, even though the language of co-construction has been adopted. Therefore, to some extent, co-construction knowledge is one way. One may call it seductive, co-optive way, as opposed to really confronting, challenging way. Different meanings of co-construction conflate. As we heard yesterday, and as the award-winning Mistra project demonstrated, that co-construction has to be at every step of the research process, and not just occasional consultation with stakeholders. The last point I want to mention in this is that uh, public representation of findings was the most critical missing link. Even when co-construction of knowledge happened, uh, scholars published their work in peer-reviewed journals with only 20 other people in the world read, uh, because that's the nature of peer-reviewed journals, which cost 500 pounds per year to subscribe to. And they are written in a language that is anyway designed to be not available to the ordinary folks. But as we saw in Mistra project yesterday, multiple forms of representation of findings is important because co-construction of knowledge means multiple purposes, only one of which is advancement of science. A very important purpose is to bring about real changes in the lives of people. And therefore, how findings are represented and communicated is very important for different stakeholders. The second broad thing we learned from uh, this study is uh, research partnerships. Because in order to engage with communities and society to undertake joint research, you need to build research partnerships. 60% of the respondents said that there was some sort of a structure. Science shops are an example of that. But the interface mechanism is essential between the boundaries of research institutions and universities on the one hand and society on the other. And in many countries, these boundaries are very sharp and not permeable at all. Um, what has been missing in interface mechanisms is the element of co-governance, a variable which has been emphasized in RRI. Co-governance with stakeholders outside research institutions and universities is a rare phenomenon still. The other thing we learned is that most of this happens through outreach. Students and faculty inside research institutions reach out to communities and other stakeholders and engage them on framing research priorities. But in reach, bringing community inside research institutions is a rare phenomenon. Because of course, you know, it gets polluted, you know, contamination of research happens if folks walk inside the research institution. The final point that we discovered from this is uh, what some of you talked about yesterday, that there are different knowledge cultures. We have to acknowledge that formal, standardized, dominant research model, even with a bit of RRI tempering with it, is a different knowledge culture than those of the communities, indigenous people, practitioners around the world. And therefore, Understanding different knowledge cultures and navigating and bridging them requires capacities which are very weak. It is important, if we are believers of RRI, to accept that there is a paradigmatic, paradigmatic shift, that there is a shift in terms of understanding where knowledge resides, not necessarily in research institutions, and what purpose the knowledge serves, not necessarily only publications. So there is a culture shift, and as some people mentioned in one of the small groups yesterday, there's also a challenge of power shift. Without power shift, today there is unequal power relations between those of us who are in research institutions and have funding to do research from Horizon 2020 and other sources, and those who are out there. So if RRI has to be mainstreamed, culture of research institutions has to change. And that culture implies understanding different knowledge cultures and understanding relations of power between knowledge cultures. So the second uh, study we just completed last month uh, is uh, what is called knowledge and engagement. 
building capacity for next generation of community-based researchers. And the purpose of this study was to look at how community-based participatory research uh, is being taught or learned around the world. And we found that most people who are doing this are actually learning it by doing, as opposed to any kind of formal uh, orientation. So I am delighted to see community-based participatory research mentioned in RRI toolkit, but I hope uh, you will also pay attention to how people learn this methodology. Uh, there is some classroom training going on, but classroom training without field interaction does not create an opportunity for practice. The practice requires getting your hands, feet, mind, body, soul, everything dirty in the real world. And sitting in a classroom and reading about community-based participatory research doesn't make it possible. What is not being taught in community-based research are issues of values, the normative dimension of research partnerships, the question of ethics, whose knowledge counts and for what purpose, and the issue of power in knowledge cultures and domination of knowledge. So there is a demand for practical training, and as was mentioned yesterday once again by some of the people, that a lot of effort in learning facilitation skills to build partnerships needs to be put in place if we are serious about practice of community-based participatory research. It is not just about research methods. It is about learning to work with different others whose knowledge culture and status in society is different than ours. Finally, I thought I will, coming from Asia, give you a few uh, questions about Asian trends. In our part of the world, scientists only interact with peers. And Scientific decision-making, funding, research questions, all is pretty opaque. It has become problematic even more because many countries in our region, India, China, Malaysia, Indonesia, we are all now chasing global ranking system. And the more we chase global ranking system, the more our research becomes irrelevant to local societies because we are now competing with Harvard and Oxford and we are bound to fail because we will never stand up to Harvard and Oxford. So the pressure from our policymakers and donors to make our universities rank up means a kind of research and a quality of research which is only published in peer-reviewed journals but does not necessarily make a difference in the lives of people at all. Gender inequality in research institutions continues to be a very serious issue. It was mentioned yesterday. We have very weak representation uh, at higher levels of research decision making, both in research councils as well as in research institutions. Uh, again, it's part of that larger question of gender inequality at other parts of society as well, but it has walked inside research institutions. And finally, the, the, the society is beginning to raise questions about scrutiny of research funding. And, uh, and I think it's important to acknowledge that when our countries in Asia have signed up to SDGs, when uh, UNESCO releases a report on growing inequality in the world, and I hope John talks about it, then our research funding must find a way to address those challenges of SDGs and inequality. However, our society is placing a lot more value to knowledge economy, but not to what I call knowledge democracy. And without knowledge democracy, political democracy is not going to work. Thank you very much.